Hey everyone, welcome to Food Talk Live. I am your host, Danny Nirenberg. Today I get to chat with the legendary Dr. Kathleen Merrigan, uh, the director of the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems at Arizona State University, and the former Deputy Secretary of Agriculture uh, during um, some of the Obama administration. Kathleen has led many initiatives and projects, but one of the things she's most known for is the US Department of Agriculture's Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative. Uh, to support local food systems around the United States. Uh, she's been breaking glass ceilings for a long time, including being the first woman to chair the Ministerial Conference of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in 2011. She was named Times Magazine's uh, 100 Most Influential People in the World in 2010. And she also helped develop USDA's organic labeling rules while uh, she was head of the Agricultural Marketing Service from 1999 to 2001. I could keep listing her many achievements and you know all the reasons that I like her, but then we would never get to talk. On a personal level, she's been a good mentor and friend to Food Tank. Kathleen, so nice to see you. Danny, it's great to be here, and you're doing a great job interviewing all kinds of people. Everyone should be tuning into Food Tank. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. I, I kind of just want to dive right in. So. I think one of the things that concerns me and so many other people is that during the last two presidential elections, we've seen this huge kind of rural urban divide in the, in the United States and a lack of, of understanding maybe about what's happening in rural areas. There's a lot of hunger in, in rural areas that I think people don't understand. There are a lot of people who feel really disenfranchised and not, and not part of, of, you know, sort of the United States in, in a lot of ways. And I'm wondering how we get past this divide of not just rural and urban, but red and blue. How do we get to more purple? Well, there's probably not a more important question, Danny. Um, I was attached to the television uh, for a week, watching all of those counties come in, trying to figure out what it means. We definitely need a new narrative when it comes to rural. People do feel left out. And the first thing I'd say is rural is not a monolithic thing. I mean, rural is as different from one county, from one place to the next. I grew up rural in Western Massachusetts. Some people don't even know Massachusetts has rural, <laughs> but that's really different than rural in Arizona um, where I'm living now. So uh, place is important. Uh, broadband, we are on the cusp of having a stimulus bill right now. There's $10 billion in there for extension of broadband. I got two kids in college. They would never move someplace where they couldn't bring their phone and be connected with all their friends in the world. So that's a big, big challenge. Um, when we think about having that conversation with rural America, I think sometimes people think it's synonymous with farming and ranching. Mm -hmm. And yet only 4% of people in rural America are farmers or ranchers. And even of that small 4%, about 60% of those people have off farm jobs. Right. So when we think about rural, we really have to think about access to healthcare, uh, if there's a little diner, uh, quality of life that um, people are struggling with because they don't have the infrastructure, um, they don't have uh, the school systems that they need. So rural um, is a job for the entire federal government. It's not just USDA. USDA. A lot of people say, oh, USDA, that's that's the rural place in the government. And certainly it is historically, but really about every part of the federal government needs to stand up and do more for rural America if we're going to change this narrative. Absolutely. You mentioned broadband, but you know there are other ways to make rural communities really vibrant places. I mean, we're losing farmers. Farmers are aging. How do we make you know, the, the town I grew up in, Defiance, Missouri, a more vibrant place to live. I mean, it, I, it's changed a lot since I moved away. Um, and it, maybe it is more vibrant in other ways, but there aren't as many farmers. So how do we keep farming and, and make, you know, these areas places people want to live? Yeah. So um, that was part of the Know Your Farmer and Know Your Food initiative that I led when I was deputy, trying to um, create jobs in rural towns across the country through local food system infrastructure, not just farming, but but the the, the businesses around farming and ranching that make a, a town a place to call home. 
I remember going to um, meetings of the Presidential Management Council, you know, the deputy secretaries of government, and we would talk about very weighty issues, cybersecurity, and, you know, uh, unbelievable issues, actually. And I would say every meeting, I'd like to talk about know your farmer, know your food. And I imagine some of those people thought I was crazy. But I started to make inroads in um, other federal departments. Um, you know, I was having conversations with the deputy secretary of the VA, for example. How could we get local food into our VA hospitals? Right. So I do think that there are a lot of strategies around, around local regional. But ultimately, we have this huge national challenge to repopulate our working lands with farmers and ranchers. And I don't know how we're going to do it with the current tools that we have in the toolbox. They're just not sufficient. In fact, in some ways, it's heartbreaking because I think we have enough tools to lure young people into farming and ranching, but really not enough to get them to succeed ultimately. Yes. So this is an issue. When I go, I've been talking to farmers across the country the last few weeks, asking them what they're hearing, what's most important. And it's not farm subsidies. Uh, it's not ethanol. It's not um, these traditional ag issues that people have been talking about um, through the campaign over the years. It's really about young people. How do we get young people on the land into our communities? How do we make these rural communities vibrant places to live? Right. And if there's a third issue that's really uniting across uh, all of rural America, no matter where you fall on the spectrum, it's probably the issue around competition, consolidation in agriculture. People feel like the odds are against them. It's, sure. it's a stacked game. And they really want the government to do something about that. Absolutely. So you mentioned, you know, bringing more young people on the land. You know, there's all of these these things that prevent young people and BIPOC farmers from being on the land, though. They don't have access to land. It's very expensive. They don't have often have the education. You know, farmers are not food, just food producers. They are business people. And often, you know, young farmers don't have those business skills. How can we create the sort of, you know, uh, intellectual infrastructure that allows them to, you know, have that access to all the things they need to do their jobs really well? Yeah, well, big, big question. But I will tell you, as a college professor, I'm in my 15th year of teaching at university. Um, I go back and forth between government and academia, so it hasn't been continuous. But I've just seen incredible interest among young people in farming and ranching. Uh, they crave getting their hands in the soil. So I don't think that we have to convince young people that it's a valuable way of life. Right. I think they're already there. But you're right, the capital costs of getting into American agriculture is huge. If you, uh, especially if you didn't inherit the, the farm, um, but even if you do, if you're one of many siblings um, inheriting the land, what do you do? Uh, so there's a, a national crisis here. And of course, um, there are a lot of issues around equity um, that we need to consider as we repopulate those working lands. I know Senator Booker has just put out a bill. I haven't had a chance to read the text yet, but it has um, a provision where there's uh, money put together to um, help black farmers, uh, young black farmers get on land. Um, our Native American communities, I live in Arizona now. <laughs> um, we have 25% of uh, the nation's uh, Native American farmers in this state. Uh, and, and it's uh, I've learned an awful lot about um, how USDA programs don't fit very well for Native needs. But there's a lot of um, a lot of history in this country around people whose lands were taken. And uh, when we're thinking about a new vision for young people on the land, I think we should take those issues into account. Absolutely. I mean, it's been really sort of you know, enlightening for me to hear reparations talked about in a serious way and, and, you know, and access to land and all of these black land trusts sort of being developed so that black and, and uh, BIPOC farmers can have, you know, land that they, they should have had, you know, generations ago. 
Yeah. And, you know, there's a government role for that. I haven't been able to follow the details, but I do know that Rhode Island, uh, the legislature set up a program where the state, I know Rhode Island is the smallest state, but here's a real innovation because they have such incredible development pressure on what little farmland they do have left. So the state decides we'll buy the farmland and then we'll sell it to young, uh, ambitious young people who want to farm at pennies on the dollar because they would otherwise not be able to afford that land. So, I mean, government can do all kinds of important and creative things, but it requires building consensus uh, and it requires a lot of um, hard work. Absolutely. So the last time I saw you in person was in January of this year, which now seems like a million years ago to me in, in a lot of different ways. And we uh, partnered with you at, and the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems on an event around um, the wisdom of indigenous food ways. And, you know, I, I think what we have not really understood well is how to, you know, include the diversity that I feel like you've been working your whole career to include in our in our food and agriculture systems, not just BIPOC folks, um, but also women in, in agriculture and, and women in leadership. And can you talk about why that's so important to have women in leadership when we're talking about food and agriculture systems? Well, sure. Um, it does seem like all of a sudden we have a lot more women in farming and partly that is because we've changed the way we count in the census of agriculture. So now you can count two principal operators as opposed to just one. So, uh, but there are women who are farming and ranching. And uh, I think we need to have diversity in leadership because uh, young people need to see themselves in their leaders and aspire to be the next generation of leaders. So diversity has always been very important to me um, I also think that people miss out on all kinds of business opportunities if they don't hear from diverse voices. I remember way back when, when I was uh, a young thing, I'm getting pretty old, uh, but when I was the AMS administrator at USDA, the Agricultural Marketing Service, and the people um, from Univision came to visit me because the promotion programs, you know, the incredible edible egg, beef what's for dinner, those <laughs> checkout programs, they weren't getting anywhere in terms of uh, contracts to do any kind of advertising on their network. And I thought about it, and I said, I know why. It's because, you know, these, these boards that USDA had at the time, these advisory boards, they didn't have anybody who who um, came from Hispanic communities to say, hey, we're the largest growing demographic. You should really be um, first in line to try to reach out to all these, these potential customers. So they, people were missing a business opportunity. So this is, um, it's just smart. It's the right thing to do. It's also the smart thing to do. Right, it's economically smart for sure, but it is the right thing to do. It's, it's a moral imperative. I want to go back to uh, this idea of infrastructure that you mentioned before. And obviously, this has been an extraordinary and unimaginable year. Uh, and, and, you know, I think we've learned a lot about our, our food and agriculture systems. In, in so many ways, we've seen how fragile they are. And I think part of that is because we've we've, you know, invested in some kinds of in infrastructure and not others. You know, we've we've sort of neglected regional uh, and local food system agriculture. What, what do you see as, you know, sort of the, the biggest fragilities? Huh. Well, there were so many, right? And at one point and here in Arizona, we were dumping 450,000 gallons of milk a day. At the same time, we had incredible lines at the food banks, right? So uh, I think one of the um, take home lessons from this pandemic uh, and what we saw in even John Tyson and the chairman of the board Tyson's putting on full page ads in the newspaper saying the food supply chain is broken, right? Um, everyone, everyone saw it, but it really revealed that we've been worshiping at the altar of efficiency. Right. And what we really need to be worshiping is resilience. And especially with climate change, the reality that we all need to confront at this point. And thank goodness, it's such a priority for the president elect and we can get back to work on this agenda, but we really need to have more resilient um, food system. And I think what was really quite painful to watch was 
uh, the meat processing sector. You saw that workers uh, were getting sick, um, really ugly stuff potentially in the press. It was in the press. I mean, they're saying that uh, supervisors were having bets on how many people would get sick. Um, it's just really horrific in terms of how people were being treated. Um, I know a lot of ranchers who uh, struggled to find a way to process their animals, right. animals that they caringly raised, and all of a sudden they're in a position where they have to euthanize them. Nobody wants that. I know um, back when I was deputy, we were working on trying to build up a network of smaller multi-species slaughter facilities across the country. We need that infrastructure, and that was pretty apparent in this in this year. Absolutely. Um, you know, last week, uh, Mark Bittman, food author and writer Mark Bittman, and a senior scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, Ricardo Salvador, wrote an op-ed uh, for the New York Times calling for a Department of Food and Wellbeing to sort of to replace our current U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, and they claim that the, our current USDA is focused more on agribusiness than eaters. And I'm wondering what you think about that first of all and what you would like usda to look like having you know been in the trenches there yeah well um usda is 17 agencies including the forest service by the way which is the largest staff year component and and the forest service has certainly been uh taxed this year with the incredible wildfires you know, we have, we spend about $3.5 billion in the budget every year for fire suppression. I don't even know what the cost has been this year uh, because they're so over budget. Um, but the uh, USDA has rural development programs. Um, they have the nutrition assistance programs. So uh, there's a lot that that department can do on these broader agendas. And I think that's what Mark and Ricardo were really reaching for in their article was really saying, this is, uh, this is a department that can do so many things. And we really need to uh, shine a light on those other aspects of, of what the department has been doing and can do. I think bringing back ethics into government is really important. I think people uh, don't have a lot of faith right now, and I can understand that. And I really worry about um, USDA employees. You know, it's been really hard for them over the last four years where they feel as federal employees, uh, they have been under attack. We've lost a lot of really great career civil servants who just couldn't hold on until the next administration. Um, so we really need to also thank those federal workers for the jobs that they do and uh, and celebrate what they do. Absolutely, absolutely. I want to, you know, you you th that leads me to sort of my next point. We've we've lost sort of you know our our belief in science because of of what has really happened over the last four years. And I'm wondering, you know, so much of of agriculture is both you know traditional knowledge that farmers have had for generations, knowing their land really well. But the other part that's so important is, is you know, science, uh, you know, real, the, the, the sort of hardcore science uh, that agronomists and economists and, you know, ex climate experts do to really make sure that our agricultural systems can, can thrive. How do we get science back into USDA after this really demoralizing kind of four years for those employees? Yeah, I don't know if all of your listeners know that um, the, the Trump administration move the uh, two of the key C, uh, science agencies at USDA, the Economic Research Service and the National Institute for Food and Agriculture from Metro DC to Kansas City, Missouri. That's not a knock on Kansas City, Missouri, but if you are a career civil servant and you've got two kids in school, uh, you're not necessarily going to be in a position to uproot your life and move across the country. So we lost a lot, a lot of good people. And we're going to have to rebuild those agencies, either in Kansas City or back in Metro DC or in both places, because science needs to guide our decision making. And what's really interesting to me, Danny, I've been involved in the last couple of years in venture capital. I never thought I'd do anything <laughs> like that. But there's this infusion of new money um, from people and a lot of people coming out of Silicon Valley, among other places, 
where they're seeing opportunity to invest in ag tech. Now, I was on um, on the Zoom the Zoom meeting yesterday uh, with a rancher talking about how he's using uh, drones to uh, check out whether his fences are all in good shape and to herd some of the cattle and it um, means that he's not compacting the ground so much driving out to all these places. I suppose you could ride a horse too, but um, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. So I think you're right at this, it's sort of the, on both spectrums, right? We, we want to value and learn from indigenous knowledge, not appropriate it, learn from it, um, work with leaders in indigenous communities in Arizona. We've got a lot of um, Hopi farmers, for example, who are doing dry, dry land farming. There's a lot of interesting things to learn there. At the same time, um, we need to keep pushing ahead and doing some, some really incredible things that we haven't even thought of before. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, my company uh, that I work with that we've invested in is insect protein, mm -hmm. rearing insects as a potential food for aquaculture and for pets. Um, my husband's so worried that I might try to feed him some insect <laughs> without telling him. And he's really, he should be worried. Um, but I think there's a lot of things that we need to explore. Um, and, and I find them exciting. Yeah, it is really exciting. So you have this really unique career. You're an academic. You've been a government servant. Um, now you're, you know, working with the VC community. But, you know, you, you've mentioned that you've spent, you know, the last few weeks listening to farmers. And, and Kathleen, I'm going to be honest, you know, a lot of people in your position would feel like they, they know enough that they don't have to listen to farmers right now. Why are you like having all these Zoom calls and really listening to farmers? <laughs> well, yesterday was because I have graduate students and we were hearing from a citrus farmer, a beef um beef producer, you know, various kinds of people. But I also do research. I have a project underway with um, beef cattle production in Colorado and Arizona. So I'm talking to farmers and ranchers for that. But I'm also curious. Um, we have a new administration coming in and I want to be able to advise the Biden-Harris transition and any leader at USDA who calls me, and I do get called quite a bit from people, what should we do about this, that, and the other thing? I want to be up to date. And sure. I don't want to assume that what I knew yesterday is on target for today. So I'm a lifelong learner. Um, I think we all should be. Absolutely. Any, any tidbits that you're hearing from farmers kind of post-election or what they're worried about that you can share? They're really worried about competition. Um, again, uh, it doesn't matter whether I'm talking to someone in Pennsylvania or Iowa or Oklahoma, that's on the tip of their lips. Um, they're really concerned about uh, those young farmers trying to find them. Um, they're really interested in local and regional agriculture. And more and more often, they're saying the word climate and they're feeling that in their uh, in their farms and the ranches and trying to figure out whether when we come together as a nation on various kinds of climate schemes, how farmers might participate in those. Will those schemes, if it's a market scheme, will it be fair? How will um, farmers data private, you know, will, will there be privacy issues? Will they be able to move from one market to the next? What if I'm a guy who's been doing right by the soil for four decades? Uh, am I going to be that that baseline when someone else hasn't been doing anything for the soil and all of a sudden they can have this huge uh, increase in, in soil health? You know, how do you make those markets fair? So they're talking about climate. So that was that's a real change. And if I've been calling around to um, farmers uh, even a year or two ago, I don't think I would have heard that as often as I do now. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and I, I think that's something I'm hearing more and more from farmers who are, you know, they're not necessarily talking about climate change or the climate crisis, but they are talking about climate because they see it every day. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, it, the, the last four years have been extraordinary, I think, in, in, a, in a lot of ways. The last year has been extraordinary. What do you hope we, we learn from this sort of political crisis that we were in with the lack of civility and 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 what do you hope we learn from you know these last 10 11 months of, of covid 
<laughs> well, I'm, we have to get back to um, Civics 101. I mean, I'm old enough that I still remember being a staffer in the U.S. Senate when women could only wear a dress on the floor of the Senate. And it, there was just all of these um, rules about behavior and how members would talk with one another on the floor. And now I see people insult each other and there's just not that kind of, I don't know, there's just not those relationships that uh, allow us to move an agenda forward. So somehow we've got to get back to that. Uh, I don't have the magic answer to that, but it is really a struggle to see, um, see the president of the United States throw out insults um, after insult to, to leaders in our country, um, to other world leaders. I, I, I could have never imagined. I mean, I, I worked very hard for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Um, it was very hopeful that we'd have our first woman president. Very excited by that. Um, and I was devastated when she lost. But as um, as as uh, worried as I was about Donald Trump back four years ago, I could never, ever have imagined what these four years would have been like. I mean, I just, they're beyond, they're beyond imagination. Speechless, leaves me speechless. So I'm really excited about January 20th. We got a lot of work to do. So much work to do. Um, so for my final question, do you have one piece of advice uh, for uh, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris? Regarding agriculture, obviously. <laughs> well, um, agriculture begins with an A, but a lot of times it's not first in line in consideration. So I think this is also in Mark Bittman and Ricardo Salvador's uh, piece and that went in the New York Times. There's so much at USDA that's so important. And uh, I really hope that they see the expanse of USDA programs and uh, prioritize rural America. I think that, uh, I think they know that, and I think they will, but if I had one piece of advice, it's about that rural narrative and, and putting USDA to work in the best possible ways. That's great advice. Um, a reminder that this episode will also appear on our podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nierberg. Kathleen, so nice to see you. Thanks for doing this, and, and I hope you stay you know, safe and well, and, and happy holidays to you. Thank you, you too. Everyone stay safe out there. It is just devastating. Absolutely.